So if you're studying GCSE physics and you want to get your head around all the equations used in the forces and motion topic, this video is for you. So on the left hand side we have all the equations that you actually need to memorize. On the right hand side are the equations you're given in the exam. Let me tell you about this guy I know. I went to university with him. He's called Isaac Newton. He's a crazy guy. He likes uh, to party a lot. He came up with three laws. He says, an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. An object in motion continues in motion with the same speed and same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. He also says, acceleration is produced when an unbalanced force acts on a mass. The greater the mass of the object being accelerated, the greater the amount of force needed to accelerate the object. That's why my Bentley needs such a massive engine. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For instance, when I hit something, it hits me back, kind of. Equation 1. Velocity equals displacement divided by time, which relates to acceleration, which is change in velocity divided by time. Uh, force equals mass times acceleration is the second law, which can also be written as force equals mass times change in velocity divided by time. Or it's change in momentum divided by time, if you know what the momentum equation is. Since force equals mass times acceleration is exactly the same as um, weight equals mass times gravity in terms of the units, because the force of gravity is measured in newtons, something's mass is measured in kilograms, and something's acceleration is measured in meters per second squared, these two equations in my mind are essentially the same thing. And we're going to look at a very cool application of Newton's second law and Newton's third law. Um, whenever two objects interact with each other and strike each other, for instance, like a red ball striking a blue ball, they apply an equal and opposite force to each other. The blue ball applies a force to the red ball, the red ball applies a force to the blue ball. These forces are equal but opposite in direction, hence the negative sign. Um, since force is equal to mass times acceleration, we can uh, replace the F with MA. Um, MV over T is also true because V over T is acceleration. The T's for both of them are the same, so we can cancel them out. Bringing MV over to the other side by subtracting it from both sides of the equation gives us MV plus MV equals zero, which can be interpreted as the amount of MV is always constant. MV is what we call momentum. Mass times velocity is momentum. This can be applied in a, in a before and after kind of situation where we say momentum before a collision is equal to momentum after a collision, uh, a very useful way of looking at motion. So now we've covered several equations. We've looked at equation number 9, uh, which is a higher tier equation. We've looked at equation number 3, number 8, number 7, and number 2. Now it's time to look at displacement time graphs and velocity time graphs, both of which are vectors. In other words, they have both magnitude and direction. Uh, if you've been looking at graphs, it's useful to know how to calculate gradient, which is change in y divided by change in x. It's also useful to know how to calculate the area of both a rectangle and a triangle, which are base time site and half base time site respectively. Here I've drawn an imaginary uh, velocity time graph for an object that starts off at an initial velocity which we're going to call u, ends up at a final velocity which we're going to call v, and um, does this in a time period we're going to call t. The distance it travels during this we're going to call s, which is a bit weird, but it's the, the letter that we use in physics for displacement. If we take velocity as displacement divided by time and rearrange for displacement, we get displacement equals velocity times time. Remember that displacement is actually the symbol s, so we can have the average velocity, which will be the initial velocity plus the final velocity, divided by 2, times by time, and that should give us the total displacement for this object that was going through some acceleration. Acceleration is equal to change in velocity divided by time, which is also v minus u over t. Rearranging that for time would give us v minus u over a. Subbing that in for t gives us v plus u divided by 2 times v minus u times a. Multiplying both of these fractions together gives us v squared plus v u minus u v uh, minus u squared. Since v u and u v are the same quantity and they're subtracting from each other, they cancel out and we're left with s, which is displacement, is equal to v squared, which is final velocity squared, minus initial velocity squared, divided by 2 times acceleration. A very useful equation, often called one of the Suvat equations. Moving on to springs, which is how forces are measured, a guy called Robert Hooke discovered that the amount a spring gets longer by is proportional to the force applied to it. If you put in a constant of proportionality, you get the spring constant. This is known as Hooke's law. 
Now, a lot of people think density means how heavy something is, but in reality, density describes mass per unit volume. Something like polystyrene is not very dense, so if you had a meter cubed of polystyrene, it wouldn't be very heavy, it wouldn't have a large mass. But a meter cubed of gold, on the other hand, would be extremely heavy, it would have a very high mass. So density is measured in kilograms per meter cubed. It's given this funny symbol. Another term often misused is pressure. So um, you might think of pressure as being uh, the amount of stress you're under because you're doing your exams, but a physicist defines pressure as force per unit area. Force is measured in newtons, area is measured in meters squared, so the unit of pressure is newtons per meter squared, although sometimes you'll see pascals, but I would recommend sticking with newtons per meter squared or whatever the area you uh, was measured in, for instance centimeter squared, that way you won't get penalized for any units uh, being wrong. Um, this is another one of those equations that can be kind of used in a before and after scenario. For instance, in a hydraulic system, uh, you have two syringes joined together by a pipe. Um, the pressure in the fluid is the same everywhere, so that means the force over area for side one and the force over area for side two are the same. So again, a useful uh, way of using the equation. Now, pressure does not just happen in solids, you also have pressure due to uh, fluids. So fluids include uh, liquids and gases, and um, we're in an atmosphere right now. If you're in a fish tank, um, you would have a column of fluid above you, and uh, that mass of fluid would be worked out, or you could calculate it from the density equation, rearranging for mass. Mass equals density times volume. The volume of this fluid would be height times length times width, times the density would give you the mass. Since weight equals mass times gravity, we can combine these equations um, and use them to calculate the force divided by the area. So you would have density times height times length times width times gravity, which would give you the force of um, the water or fluid above you, um, divided by the area, which would be length times width, since length and width are on the top and the bottom of the equation, they can be cancelled, and we get Pressure equals rho hg, which is density times height times gravity. Now, human beings are pretty weak animals, and um, we find it very useful to create machines that can multiply the force that we are able to generate. Hydraulic machines do this, and so do levers, right? So a great example of a lever is a spanner. Um, the longer you make the lever arm, the more you multiply the turning effect you're able to produce. Um, the turning effect is defined as a moment, so or a torque. So moment is defined as force times distance. Now in certain special situations, when something is perfectly balanced and is in equilibrium, the sum of the anti-clockwise moments will be equal to the sum of the clockwise moments. So this becomes really useful in engineering and mechanics um, because we're able to work out um, the force required to keep something in balance. So whenever solving problems like this, you should always start by stating um, the principle of moments, which is anti-clockwise moments equals the clockwise moments. Really, it's the sum of the anti-clockwise moments equals the clockwise moments when in equilibrium. Hi, looking damn fleeky.